an analysis of the book, an ABC for laymen, dedicated in 1585 to William Cecil, by George Wither, and all other poetical works, by him, indicate, that Wither must have been an early pseudonym of Christopher Marlowe, much like another of the multiple pseudonyms of Marlowe. William Shakespeare if the child prodigy, poet genius and playwright Marlowe, from 1593 on, under various pseudonyms, including Shakespeare, did demonstrate an unprecedented literary productivity over decades, this matchless level of activity only becomes understandable, if it did not start suddenly, from the age of 30, but gradually from early beginnings. Marlowe must already have had an incredibly prolific level of activity, before a genius of the size of Shakespeare respectively Marlowe must undoubtedly have begun early in his life, to test his unimaginable talents. Why so few testimonies have been preserved? The fact, that not a single work by Marlowe was printed in his official lifetime, only one anonymously, that is Tambone in 1590, is to be understood only in this aspect. In the extremely repressive Elizabethan era, Marlowe obviously was well aware of the need, to be able to write his politically dangerous plays and thoughts only secretly, in order to remain unrecognizable and protected as an author. That his plays, after his sudden disappearance, May 1593, if previously known, had to be published still under his former name, Marlowe is plausible. Such insights point to a seldom considered option, that Marlowe already in his brilliant early years, about 1575 to 1593, was highly endangered by his advanced secular ideas, and that he, from early on, was used to veil his plays and identity and write anonymously, pseudonymously under names such as, Monday, Breton. Warner, Clapham. Peachum, Harrington. Wither, Gager and others. These poets are not well known to the public and their pseudonymity may not seem obvious at first glance, but clues and contextual arguments can be derived from significant text sections of all these authors mentioned. Marlowe, in principle, seamlessly only continued his early practiced vital covered strategy, after his supposed death. The poet George Wither dedicated this book and ABC for laymen to his patron William Cecil, Lord Burley, High Treasurer, in 1585. William Cecil in 1585 was the Chancellor of the University of Cambridge. Marlowe, for six years, from 1581 to 1587, was a student in Cambridge. It is documented that half of the time he was absent and or abroad. In his six years in Cambridge Marlowe was in the service of the Crown and William Cecil. The detailed content of Wither's ABC for Laymen, contains impressive text and thought parallelism to Shakespeare. To get a glimpse of an idea, reflect the following example. In Wither's ABC, in 1585, he contemplated under the letter C, the term canker, by writing, 
the canker and rust fretting and consuming even those things that amongst men are so precious. A few years later, Shakespeare wrote, in Venus and Adonis, foul cankering rust the hidden treasure frets but gold that puts to use, gold begets. Be fully aware. The probability. From a scientific point of view. Is extremely high, that both texts originated from the same, identical author. During his frequent absence from Cambridge, where there was in Holland, Leiden, in France, Reims, or elsewhere, where he published after his return to London a book entitled A View of the Marginal Notes of the Popish Testament at Reims in France, in 1588. We know from true Shakespeare's writings, that he had an encyclopedic knowledge of the Bible. There are roughly 1,350 total identifiable instances, where Shakespeare references or quotes directly from the Bible, found throughout his plays. Without the ability to recognize biblical narratives and character types within the canon, you can merely scratch the surface of Shakespeare's rich and enlightening play. In this book, George with a corrected revised all false interpretations of the printed marginal notes of the New Testament of the Reims Bible from 1582. Be aware of the vast biblical knowledge, that with a head or must have acquired, to correct and correctly understand the biblical references, previously misinterpreted, according to Wither's opinion. Such an immense, fundamental knowledge must be allowed George Wither. But not, seriously, William Shakespeare, the merchant from Stratford. Note that Wither dedicated his book to the Archbishop of Canterbury, John Whitgift, member of the Privy Council, and criticized and corrected the marginal notes of the New Testament of the Reims Bible, from 1582. Also consider, that Canterbury was the hometown of Marlowe, and that the Archbishop Whitgift was well acquainted, as his bishop predecessors, with the poet genius and superstar of the London theatre, Christopher Marlowe. From a letter of the Privy Council, Marlowe is known to have been in Reims at that time. On behalf of William Cecil and the Crown. The circular text, I grow and wither both together, clearly corresponds to Marlowe's life motto on his portrait. Quod me nutrit, me distrut. The poem text reveals his infant prodigy and his fatal destiny, yet few have been more approved, none so unseen, so generally loved. The circular text, as well as the poem about wither from 1614 seem to reveal a personal identity between Marlowe and his pseudonym with a
from dealer rooms engraving of George Wither, in 1622, we learn that he checked the giant vice of the times, meaning that he controlled his own historical replacement, and had most courage, when most perils were, Marlowe's typical complimentary style. Thus, that he should rightly, wear the laurel. From the little poem below Wither's portrait, in 1635, in Wither's highly impressive emblem poem book, we learn that, metaphorically, in his past, what I was, that is his first life, he passed by. In his future, what I shall be, that is his second life, he remains. Invisible, none do see. Again fitting best to Marlowe. It would not be difficult, to continue to deduce strong further arguments for an identity between Wither and Marlowe from Wither's mighty poetical work. But, But let's limit ourselves, to add a few particular remarkable contextual examples, out of Wither's impressive works. Can anyone really assume, that in 1612, when Prince Frederick Henry, heir to the throne of England, tragically died, the greatest English poet of all, and of his own time, Shakespeare, aged 48, felt no need, to give this eminent national event an appropriate poetical setting. This is, literally, unthinkable. Shakespeare Academe has never, even attempted, to find a plausible explanation. The solution is obvious, if we realize, that the true Shakespeare, alias Covet Marlowe, actually wrote the mournful elegies upon Prince Henry's death under the pseudonymous identity of George Wither. It strongly reminds one, not only of the ghost in the play Hamlet, where the true Shakespeare invented an interlocution between the ghost, an inner voice of his deceased father, and himself. but also of the construction of the figure Great Britain in the dedication to the essay Polymantia, in which an anonymous author, W.C., for contextual reasons, highly likely Marlowe, Shakespeare, in his dedication to Robert Everett, the Earl of Essex, takes on the role of England. With their expresses, that Opinion give me not a name, that is, public opinion, reputation, credit sees him as not existent, as dead. He was never beholding yet to fame. That is, real fame has not yet reached him. We all should be the witness of my discontent, that is, we should be aware of his griefs, that nevertheless helped, to improve his eloquence. I mourn for your our public loss, that is. He is complaining, by comparing Prince Henry's, and his own losses. With there asks himself and compares his situation. B1 am I awake? If this be true? That is, is Prince Henry really dead? B2. Why do I stay behind thee, to do either? That is, why he himself did not die. B3 My fate compels me, I must abide. That is, he has still to share the mischiefs of the age. I am ordained to live, till I have tried. That is, he must stay alive and cannot yet die. Wither in 1613 published satirical essays, Abuses Stripped. Registered January 1613 in which he not only offended many classes and interests so that he was committed to the notorious prison in the Marshalsea in London Southwark, March 20, 1614 and released July, 26, 1614, but also,
frankly disclosed the methods how we, as the readers, are abused and deceived. With his sophisticated literary tricks. With a satirically unveils his literary tricks and methods, to the reader. For instance he reveals us, in a typical Marlowian conscious contradiction, that he often writes. Without any poetical additions. Or without any famed allegories. That he will not please us. He wrapped up his meaning in dark riddles. He should have been less understood. He does not shame, to speak the truth. He has nakedly thrust it forth, without covering. He had apparelled his mind, in dark parables. Few or none had understood him. He should do better, or be silent. Thereafter, he may be obscure enough. But yet, in this it's not his meaning. Most care not for a secret jerk. He will be an honest wit in covertly nipping them, etc. etc. This literary philosophy fits best to a concealed highly confident and sophisticated poet like Marlowe. Shakespeare. Note. Shakespeare's play, Timon of Athens was written in the first decade of the 17th century, roughly in the same time, than Withers' abuses stripped and whipped, in 1613. Note. In the epilogue of abuses stripped and whipped George Wither wrote. But yet, would I not of thee think, O oh man? that I with time and the Athenian desire, to make thee so much feel thy woe, to go and hang thyself, I mean not so, or for to drive thee, thereby to despair, this is not my purpose, my intent is more fair. Thus, believe it, or not. In the epilogue of Wither's abuse is stripped and whipped, a poem of seventy-four lines. Wither reveals that he composed the play Timon of Athens. Since he desired that we so much feel our woe with this generous Athenian. That is, with himself, the protagonist of Shakespeare's play, Timon of Athens, that is, with his autobiographical self. A previous key video. See link above. Clearly demonstrated, that many poem books in Shakespeare's time bared female title names, such as Lucretia, Lycia, Cynthia, Fidesa, Aviza, Polymentaire, Fidelia, etc. etc. In all these poems, it was concluded, See link above. That a concealed author was constantly and ambiguously in a dialogue with his self created muse, with his super ego, or higher self, with the inspiring goddesses of his personalized, specific inner afflictions or crisis. Such as his shame or disgrace, his invisibility, his loyalty, his ambiguity his god or goddess of art, his freedom, his fidelity, and so on, and so on. The pseudonymous author of all these highly artistic poem books with female title names is always one and the same. Christopher Marlowe disclosing by dialoguing and disputing, with his talent and destiny, that is with his fateful muses.
Withers book, entitled Withers Motto, 1621, with over 2,200 verses, is a self-confident, egocentric credo, eulogizing the virtues, quasi a letter from himself, about himself, the author. Wants all the world to read, and heed. Withers sets himself up as a model, to which England should conform. Always fond of calling himself the remembrancer, reminding Britain of her moral and social degeneracy, it was the poet's divinely imposed duty to write. Impressive text passages in that book disclose astonishing details of Withers' actual life situation as a poet. He admits, that my name, whenever it shall be writ, should be obscured, with twenty, after it. Meaning, his identity and name, whenever you read from him, has continuously been altered, so that no one ever noticed, that the true Shakespeare obscured his identity with so many pseudonyms such as Carrie, May, Davenant, Sylvester, Sands, Drayton, Beaumont. Fletcher, Haywood, Brougham, Qualls, Shakespeare, Massinger etc. Does anyone really believe, that it is pure coincidence, that Wither describes his own life situation, by quoting the most famous Hamlet phrase, to be, or not to be? When Wither admits, that he had rather be degraded from the greatest title of honor, that could be given him, constrained to deny his motto. Doesn't that fit better, and only to Marlowe? But by no means to George Wither? Wither is outing himself, as the author of his Scourge of Vanity, when he writes. In my scourge of vanity, which I am now almost ashamed, to read over. He obviously refers to his Satyr 1, Book 2, in his, Abuses Stripped and Whipped, in 1613. In Satire 1, On Vanity, of Book 2, with their wrote very amazing sentences, that require interpretation. Do you suppose, by a few carved stones, scarcely enough to cover all your bones? To be immortal? If you long to live, after your death, why then let virtue give and add that living glory, to your name? Let her sound forth the trumpet of your fame, and it shall last. So shall your sacred memory be dear, to those, that live and while lest your body lies, entombed on earth your soul shall mount the skies, but if in pleasure, you hadst lived long. We learn, that the poet and satirist is already dead, and buried, but, is he really immortal? He was in fact able, to live, after his death, and his muse, his virtue added glory, while living to his fame, which shall last whilst his body lies entombed on earth, his soul mount the skies, and he lives a long life. Are those statements? A famous deceased and buried poet, living after death. Not irrefutable indications, that the author Marlowe is writing and hiding behind with his satire? And that where there must be a pseudonym, Another unexplained amazing paradox is, that literary sciences have never attempted, as far as I can judge, to elucidate the contextual literary relationship between the two highly similar books. Wither's motto, and Taylor's motto. Both printed in 1621, with their Latin contrary subtitles. 
Everything suggests that Marlowe with his outstanding ability to depict complementary dialoguing issues poetically and philosophically, was putting himself ambiguously into opposite personalities. I predict that there will be no other way to explain the simultaneous complementary thematic and conceptual parallelism within the same year, 1621, than to recognize both George Wither and John Taylor, the so-called water poet, as pseudonyms or pen names of the identical poet. Let's also select and quote some contextual examples out of Taylor's motto. Supporting the idea of both poets being pen names of concealed Marlowe in 1621, some years before the printing of Shakespeare's first folio, at the end of 1623. Taylor tells us that he was sitting in his boat when he was repeating lines of Hero and Leander. A clear reference to Marlowe. A group of three, the Triple Three, enjoyed his recital. Took great delight in that, called him ashore. A definite reference to three publications with three poets and three interpretations of Hero and Leander, in 1598. Marlowe, George Chapman, and Henry Petau. For details, see link above. And he continues by writing. Dot at the end, gave him a draft of Helican. An anthology of Elizabethan pastoral poems, first published in 1600, the majority of contributors are by names of Marlowe, such as Drayton, Beard, Chittle, Monday, Peel, Constable, Green, Smith and others. Difficult to make credible or understandable for the ignorant. To get a glimpse of understanding, study links above, exemplarily for Samuel Beard and Michael Drayton. The Triple Three is a clear reference to three publications of three poets with three modification and additions to Hero and Leander in 1598. The poets are Christopher Marlowe, George Chapman and Henry Petau. For details of the hero and Leander triple, and the meaning of Taylor's so-called triple three. See link above. Taylor enlightens the reader when writing. A. The one is the greatest murderer alive that does a man of his, good name deprive, with slanders and lies. And. B. To blast a good man's name with scandal's breath, makes, his dishonor, long survive, his death. In 1622, George Wither wrote his poems, Fair Virtue, The Mistress of Philaret, a long, often allegoric panegyric verse, written in many different verse forms, of which Wither was a master. Notice that Shakespeare's first folio, in 1623, had not yet appeared, and nobody had ever reported to have seen or met a poet named Shakespeare. In Wither's poetical rhomboidal dirges, see two facsimiles, of six, we learn from the author. A. That because he played with the burning coals of flames, he deeply sunk, asking himself. If he shall never raise again? B. That he perished in his youth's sweet prime.
unmoaned he must die and no man will ever know. Why? In 1635, with a published a very impressive collection of emblems, combined with Latin circular texts, with thirty lines of verses and an appendix of a lottery of corresponding poems of eight lines. Behind various emblems, it seems not difficult, to recognize tight connections to Marlowe, or Shakespeare. Astonishingly, we find Marlowe's life motto painted on his portrait in 1585. Also on Withers emblems. Reflect two examples. Withers added title poem. From that, by which I somewhat am, the cause of my destruction came. And the Latin circular text, both contain precisely Marlowe's philosophy. I hope you agree that this can hardly have happened purely coincidental. Perhaps, even more convincing, is another of Withers' emblem poems, Book 1 Emblem 15, the circular text, also expressing clearly Marlowe's life motto. Just listen to some lines of the added poem. Observe, I pray you, how the greedy flame the fuel, on an altar does consume. How it destroys, that which feeds the same, and how the nourisher away does fume. But let my flesh, my time, and my estate, be so consumed, so spent, so wasted be, that they may nourish grace, and perfit that, for which all these were first bestowed on me. So when I quite am vanished out of seeing, I shall enjoy my now concealed being. <laughs>